Okay, welcome back. Um, hopefully you're all sufficiently caffeinated from tea, coffee, and uh, enjoyed uh, some time networking outside. Now back to real SRE networking. And I'd like to introduce Florian Weingarten from Shopify, who's going to talk about this. Yeah, good morning. Uh, thanks for coming to my talk. Um, my name is Flo, and I work on um, the production engineering team at Shopify. And today I want to talk about um, scaling Shopify's multi-tenant architecture across multiple data centers. So just a few uh, quick words about Shopify. Um, our headquarters is in Ottawa. We're a Canadian company. And uh, we have a couple of other offices in Toronto and Montreal and uh, Waterloo and Especially for the production engineering team, we also um, have a bunch of remotes in, uh, all over Europe, but also in uh, North America. And um, a quick, uh, quick history uh, lesson about how Shopify started. So um, Shopify was um, started by this guy from Germany who around 2003, 2004, um, left Germany to go to Canada and um, he decided to sell snowboards and he wanted to sell them online. Um, so he was looking for uh, um, evaluating all the existing e-commerce solutions and um, he, he f wasn't really satisfied with any of them and um, everything he found was kind of targeted for like enterprise and like for, for existing businesses who want to transition online but there wasn't really anything to start a business online and since he had a, he had a very strong programming background he um, decided to use this weird Japanese programming language that nobody has heard of in 2003 and um, that's how Shopify started and um, um, after a while he realized that maybe um, the software that he wrote to sell snowboards should be the product and not the snowboard. So um, he decided to restructure the application to be a multi-tenant architecture. And um, just to give you an idea of the, the kind of um, size we're talking about, um, we, today we have around um, 275,000 uh, 275, merchants and on a normal day we do about um, something around 16,000 requests um, per second and um, so we have, we have around um, more than, more than 1,200 employees, um, most of them in, in Canada, um, that's me. Uh. <laughs> so the, the, the talk is kind of structured as um, as a history um, around the, the evolution of our platform. So in 2004, there was only one tenant, um, Snow Devil, there was the snowboard store. And then shortly after, we, we changed it to be a multi-tenant architecture. And um, what I mean by multi-tenant is that the same code base and the same deployment um, supports multiple um, users, multiple tenants, um, in contrast to just deploying the same single tenant application multiple times. So. Um, for the next um, couple of years, there wasn't really that much changes in this architecture. Um, but then around 2011, 2012 or so, um, as, 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 as this, um, the platform got bigger and we, um, if you saw Emil's talk, you heard a little bit about flash sales. Um, so those things happened and um, we, we ran into serious scaling problems. Um, um, for, for a little bit of um, context, um, we are pretty much a traditional Ruby and Rails uh, monolith. And there is scaling limitations that you, that you will run into. Um, so in, in 2013, 2014, we, we started to address those. Um, and there was a project called Database Isolation or Database Sharding that I'm going to talk about a little bit more, um, which bought us a lot of time and a lot of um, breathing room. And um, so for tw in 2015, we had some time to work on, um, to focus on redundancy and like disaster recovery. Um, and now um, what we're working on for the last year or so um, is the, how do, we, um, how do we scale across multiple data centers? So not only have a backup data center, but actually serve traffic out of both, which is very unconventional for a Ruby and Rails application, I would say. Um, okay, so just a, just a quick recap about flash sales. Um, Emil was talking about this on Monday, but um, uh, just to give you some more context, um, we have a f couple of cas customers who, um, a bit, uh, essentially a flash sale is like a limited inventory or limited time um, sale and what usually happens is that someone is posting something on Twitter or on, on, on Snapchat or like anywhere and, and those people like for example Kylie Jenner um, 
they, they have millions of followers and the, uh, this gets retweeted to millions of people and um, it's a little bit comparable to like what 10 years ago was um, known as like the, the slash dot effect. So your, your, your URL gets posted somewhere and then you get hammered with traffic. And um, basically this, this Kylie Cosmetics store is a good example. They, they, they sell lipsticks and um, they're on, uh, announced on Twitter and they, they basically say it's available right now and then this is usually the first time that we even hear, hear about it. And then all those people um, <laughs> are just waiting for this to, to become available and they're all, uh, <laughs> all trying to buy it at once. And what, what this looks like on our end is this. Um, um, yeah, so we, we don't know about this in advance and um, this causes huge spikes in, our, uh, in all of our graphs and um, there was many moments, um, especially like around 2013 or so, where we were faced with the decision, um, is this really worth it for us? Like, um, do we keep those customers? Because um, they, they pay the same price as everybody else but they use way more resources. But, so it would have been the easy choice to just fire them and just like move on. But we decided to, um, to embrace this and to prepare ourselves for, for this um, traffic pattern and um, yeah, there's, there's some problems involved here and um, the, the maybe surprising problem to some of you is that um, because those flash sales are always, um, they, they come and go within seconds, yeah, at least minutes and um, in our experience the, um, provisioning resources on demand for this like in an elastic like cloud uh, fashion is, is not really possible because as soon as the resources would be provisioned uh, the flash sale might already be over. So what I like to call the flash sale problem is that compared to our like regular um, normal traffic baseline um, we need to be massively over provisioned pretty much all the time. Um, okay, so I want to outline this talk a little bit around multi-tenant architectures and the different um, trade-offs that you have. So um, in the beginning I said um, um, there's this um, extreme that we started with where there's only one tenant and then we s went to multi-tenant but I, I'd like to think of this as a, as a bit of a spectrum where you can be not only on the two extremes but also somewhere in the middle. And both of those architectures have advantages and disadvantages. Um, we started with the one on the very left which I like to call share nothing and then um, on the other hand is share everything which is what we did pretty much right after and what we have been doing for the, for the longest time. And um, when I say share nothing this is basically um, what like uh, software like Magento which is a different uh, e-commerce software does or basically dedicated deployments for every merchant. And with the share everything architecture you have the advantage that you have way more capacity um, and that all of your tenants can um, utilize that capacity. Uh, which makes it very economical, very cheap, it's great for flash sales because you don't have to um, do any kind of capacity planning for every individual merchant but you just have to do this for the entire platform. What we didn't like about this is that there's no isolation and no resiliency. There, so if there's a, um, like a database outage or something it's very easy to get cascading failures and like it's, it's theoretically possible that a flash sale of one shop can take down the entire platform. So obviously that's, that's something that we wanted to avoid. Um, and f if, you, if you strictly follow like the traditional Ruby on Rails um, uh, stack then, then this can be a little bit hard to scale because um, well the, the first thing that we ran into was the database um, because it just became too big and too uh, expensive to, to scale vertically. Um, yeah so this worked for the longest time for like until 2013 which is um, seven or eight years of Shopify, this was good enough and it's probably good enough for most people but um, we, we decided that this is not good enough anymore for us. We, we want those um, red cells in this table, uh, we, want the, we want the green ones too. So um, for the rest of this talk I want to walk through the spectrum and, and tell you what we, how we moved around when we, what we evaluated. So we started on the very left then we immediately jumped to the very right then we moved a little bit more to the left and a little bit even more there and there was a little bit too far and so we went back and I think this is kind of where we are right now and I think this is for now for the, for, for the foreseeable future this is our sweet spot. Um, and the message that I want to take, uh, give you here is that it's not left or right but you can be in the middle and it's okay to like move around and experiment. Um, so this is the conventional Rails application. Um, you have a couple of web workers, you have a couple of job workers and then you have one big database where everything goes in. 
and Ruby on Rails is um, very, um, they have this motto of like convention over configuration, so basically they expect everyone to do this and if you want to do something else then it gets a little bit tricky. Um, the, the problem here is that this is, um, become, it's a single point of failure, it, 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 the database becomes very big and the bigger it gets, the more expensive it gets to scale it. Um, and this is not just um, MySQL, I'm, I'm hand waving some of the details. So when I say database, this also means like Redis, Elasticsearch, Memcache, like all those things that, that, might, that you might have. Um, so what we did as a first step is this. And um, by the nature of the, the our architecture is very um, obvious to partition. So all of our, it's not, um, our data doesn't have a lot of cross references, so you can easily slice the data based on which shop ID it has. So basically, every single column in our database has a shop, uh, every single table has a shop ID column. And so you can easily say um, all of this shop's data goes in database one and all of that shop's data goes in a different database. And then there's not really a lot of um, cross references going on. So for us, this was, a, was, a, was an obvious choice on how to partition the data. Um, so we, this was basically um, uh, application level charting where we taught Ruby on Rails how to talk to more than one database and how to figure out which one your data is in. Um, and this um, worked very well for two or three years and um, bought us a lot of um, breathing room and made it, made it way easier to scale the uh, databases. And um, we, didn't have, we didn't really have that much um, problems with flash cells anymore after this. Um, so what we, what, what we focused on next was um, backup sites. So to give you some context, um, Shopify has moved around from data center to data center um, over the years, but we um, always only were using one data center at a time. So as soon as the migration was done, we would um, move out of the old one basically. Um, so for, for a long time, if there would have been a catastrophic outage, we would have, we, we would have been required to like um, rent new space, provision everything from scratch would probably have taken days. So we wanted to focus on how can we do this not within days, but maybe within hours or even minutes. Um, yeah, so why do we want to do this? For obviously for redundancy and disaster recovery, but also if you, if you are a smaller company or a startup, then it's inevitable that your, especially your network infrastructure just grows organically. You're not going to buy 10 racks and plan everything like, the database and the database replica shouldn't be in the same rack or stuff like that. You just fill up the racks because you don't have more money to do it, right? So the, um, the old data center was very, um, pretty much like the left picture here. It was a huge mess, so we wanted to rebuild it from the ground up. Um, and that was one of the reasons why we needed to have the second data center. Um, so basically how this looks is we have, we have Shopify running in a data center and then we have pretty much from a logical perspective and an uh, exact copy of this. Everything looks the same. The, the network underneath is, is cleaned up, but the, from, a, the abstract, from an abstract view, it's everything is the same. And um, if both data centers are healthy, then basically um, we set up MySQL replication and stuff like that. So if one of the data centers would go down, the second one has a um, up -to -date, um, reasonably up-to-date um, replica of the data. Now, if there would be a failover, uh, like a disaster event, we can do a failover and this entire thing gets switched and then um, the other one is serving traffic and at some point um, maybe the old one comes back or maybe this was a, a scheduled failover and then we switch the replication around and uh, the same thing. Basically they just switch roles. Um, so this is how we, how failovers used to look like at Shopify. Um, there was probably like 10 people in a room and like a DBA and a network person and some developers and um, all, all those kinds of people. Nobody really knew what the other people were doing. Everybody had like a two page playbook with steps that they need to do and that can go wrong. It was very scary we did it like maybe once a year or so. Um, so this was obviously not what we wanted. So what we did is we, um, we um, basically replaced all those people by, by one script and um, the, uh, the advantage that this gives us obviously it, it's much quicker and um, uh, for us this takes around I would say less than five minutes which um, involves about two minutes of checkout downtime where people can't actually buy anything but uh, at no point in time is the storefront down so you even during a failover you can still browse the products and stuff you, you just can't buy anything. Um, and the way we did this is that it's um, 
it's, it's pretty easy to roll back. It's not scary at all anymore. Uh, it's pretty easy to understand. And um, a single person, like we sometimes have interns doing this um, just to teach them how it works. Um, and yeah, this was a huge improvement. Um, about the um, how we do this without downtime, I'm going to come back to that a little bit later. But I need, uh, I need to give you a little bit more context first. Okay, so we now have two data centers. One of them is sitting there, burning power, doing nothing, and that's the next problem that we wanted to address a little bit more. Um, yeah, so. If you look at this, um, the, the, the red boxes mean those, those servers are not doing anything, they're not serving traffic. And um, obviously, um, the, the first row in this picture, the web workers and the job workers, I want to call this the, the stateless tier um, because that's not um, storing any data, it's just basically CPU power that we use. And um, there's, this is like, as you can see, 50% of our um, stateless CPU is, uh, is wasted. So, what we actually wanted to do is something like this, where um, at least um, the, the databases still um, are only active in one, one data center at a time, but at least we can utilize the entire state list here. So um, we would have, um, uh, as I said earlier, each shop's entire data set is in exactly one database per data center, and then there's replicas in the other data center. So we are not trying to serve the same shop out of multiple data centers at once, but we're trying to utilize every data center at least. So with this, um, the advantage here is that all those web workers are actually doing something. But this brings us to the next, um, the next problem here is that um, there's still no isolation. Um, it's, it's a little bit better in terms of isolation than before. Um, but if you imagine that, um, let's say, uh, database one and database two are both in the first data center and a database one shop has a flash sale, then that flash sale can um, exhaust the entire CPU capacity and starve the shop that's in the different database. So we want more isolation where it's harder or less likely that one shop can starve the CPU, CPU capacity from the others. So the, the idea that we thought about a little bit is what we call potting. Um, basically potting you can think of um, small individual copies of what we had before. Um, so you just sit several shop files next to, next to each other, each with their dedicated capacity. So now if a shop in part one has a flash sale, it can't steal CPU from a shop in part two. Um, so this is better in terms of isolation. Um, you, yeah, um, as I said earlier, um, each pod is only active in one data center at a time and um, uh, not, not all of them um, need to be in the same one. Okay, so this brings me to the next um, question. Um, how do we route requests to the right part? And something to, to, uh, that you need to know is that for Shopify, most of our merchants um, uh, use custom domains and um, we don't control those domains. So the, the, the merchant already has a domain because he already has a website or he buys a domain on GoDaddy or something. Y you can also do buy the domain through the Shopify website, but um, most people or many people bring their own and they point their domains to our IP addresses. So um, I was surprised to learn that uh, when I started that, um, so this sounds like why don't you just do C names, but um, on root domains you can't actually do C names, you have to do A records, so there's no workaround for this, you have to point them, you have to point the domains to IP address. And now the problem is if, um, if, you have, if you have two separate shops, they might be in different data centers, but they're using the same IP address. So how do we get them, how do we get the traffic to the right place? And um, we have a software called Sorting Hat that we wrote. Um, if you're familiar with Harry Potter, uh, Sorting Hat is the, the magical hat that tells um, which house of Hogwarts a student has to go into. Uh, and that's what we call our Lua application um, that runs in our Nginx load balancers. So if you, if you saw Emil's talk on Monday, um, we're using a software or a, a library called uh, OpenResty, which is essentially um, Lua bindings for the Nginx C API. And you can do all kinds of uh, cool stuff with that. Um, something that we use is um, we have a MySQL database who stores this mapping of which domain uh, has to be routed to which shop. So the, this Lua code that runs in the load balancer um, ma makes this MySQL lookup and it's heavily cached and all this kinds of stuff. So um, the load balancer can know which um, upstream pool um, the request needs to be sent to without ever talking to the Rails application. Um, and then uh, there's all kinds of other cool APIs that, that this um, 
uh, gives you. So there's one called Nginx Balancer, which allows you to define something called a dynamic upstream balancer. And what this essentially means is that you can implement your own load balancing algorithms, um, which is super cool. And uh, a couple of other things that we do, Emil was talking about how we do edge caching in Nginx so that we can uh, serve, serve cache hits without ever having to talk to the Rails process, because talking to Rails is expensive. Um, another thing that we do is we, we never write Nginx access logs to disk. We immediately send them to Kafka. Um, we do throttling. We serve SSL certificates out of MySQL so we don't have to store them on the disk and all this kind of stuff. So uh, this Nginx Lua is, is super powerful. Um, so now I want to get back to this, um, I want to examine this trade-off a little bit more between isolation and utilization. So if we looked at this previous picture, as I mentioned, this is more expensive than, than the shared everything architecture that we had at first, because now um, each part individually has access to less CPU capacity. And as I said, we always need to be over-provisioned, so um, now you have to over-provision every single part individually rather than just over-provisioning the entire platform. And um, yeah, what this means is that we have less, we need to buy more servers because each part has less CPU. So the idea that we kind of wanted is we, we wanted a little bit of a trade off where um, we came up with this idea of floating capacity. So basically, every part has dedicated capacity, which means those are web servers or job, so job workers that um, are only doing work for this one part. But in the event of a flash sale, we can use floating capacity. So those are basically web servers that are just sitting there waiting for one of the other parts to exhaust its dedicated capacity, and then they can, then can, they can be used by that. And the way this um, can be implemented is using, um, using this uh, sorting hat uh, and Nginx Lua thing um, as a, basically as a custom load balancing algorithm in Nginx. Okay, so if we come back to this picture from the beginning, where I said um, shared everything is not good enough for us. We want something more in the middle, and this is what, what, what we have in the middle. So um, if we do this parts with floating capacity, that's a very good trade-off for us. Um, we, we get rid of the pain points from the previous one while keeping most of the, um, most of the advantages. Uh, so in, 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 in particular, um, we now have isolation, which we didn't have before. And this is very trivial to scale horizontally. We just have to buy, we just buy more parts and, sit and set them next to each other. Okay, so for the, for the last, um, for the, the next chapter, I want to um, examine more about the, the routing part and go a little bit deeper down the, um, look, take a deeper look at the network. Um, so we now know how do we scale the application, but um, we also have to think about how do we scale the network and how do we, um, how do we do routing and how do requests end up in the right data center. So, um, First, let's, let's go back to the data center failover that I was talking about before. Um, so as I said, customers point their, IP address, uh, point their domains at our IP addresses. And we can't do, um, for that reason, we can't really do a DNS-based failover where we just update um, a DNS record and then everything works. Um, we have to somehow get the traffic um, you, to the right spot, even though they, they, they are using the same uh, destination IP address. So we, we um, in the event of a failover, what happens is that the previous data center that was active withdraws its BGP announcements, and then the new data center announces BGP. Um, if you haven't heard of it, BGP is um, uh, something called an exterior gateway protocol, which is, was meant to uh, exchange routing information between different autonomous systems. So for the most part, it's, it's being used to, you can think of it as um, basically a router telling the internet, hey, I, I know how to do, I can serve traffic for this IP address and then you can withdraw those files and so on. Um, so something that we learned here is um, that we didn't really think about from the beginning is that if you, um, if you start uh, your startup at like, um, in early stages, you're probably not gonna get your own IP addresses. But um, what this, the problem that we ran into is that at some point we wanted to do a failover, but then we realized those IP addresses don't actually belong to us. We just rented them from the data center so we can't move them. So if you wanna do something like this, and if your business model kind of depends on people pointing their domains to your IPs, then you should get your own IPs as early as possible. Otherwise, you can't move them and you're stuck with this one data center. Uh, so we had this really long period where we kind of had to contact all of those 100,000 people and ask them to go to GoDaddy, and some of those people have no idea what that means. Um, 
Yeah, so the, the problem with this approach um, that, that you run into is also that BGP is not instant. Um, it's, it's, it gets, if you withdraw your routes or you announce them somewhere else, there's a, there's a certain propagation delay for those routes to um, go from router to router, and it takes a while for, the, for all the core internet routers to, to know about this. So even after we do this withdrawal and announcement, we would still see traffic coming in for the, um, into the old data center. Uh, and then what we, what we did to, to um, not uh, experience any downtime here is that we, um, we basically buy um, uh, uh, a direct, basically a direct fiber optics connection between the two data centers that doesn't go get routed over the internet. And then every time a request comes in um, because of the BGP um, propagation delay, we just send it over this direct connection. Uh, so the, the sorting head load balancer here would know oh, this is actually not for this is for port five or something, and port five is actually in the different in the, in the other data center, and then it would be sending it transparently over this internal link. So um, even though the, rec the request comes in in the wrong data center, it just gets kind of tunneled over the, to the right one. <clears throat> um, Okay, so if we look a little bit closer, um, for, until now I was talking about the load balancer, but we actually have multiple load balancers. And so I want to talk a little bit about how we scale this. So um, basically a request comes in, the router picks the load balancer, and the load balancer runs the sorting head code, which knows which upstream pool, which, which, which web server to send the, the request to. But the question is now, how does the, um, how does the router decide which load balancer to use? Um, so the reason why we have multiple load balancers, um, at the beginning it was just like a um, backup thing, what, like we wanted to be prepared for the case that one of them dies. But then um, today we actually need multiple load balancers. Um, if we get DDoS, for example, sometimes we, we run out of load balancer CPU and stuff like that. So we, we need them for redundancy but also for load risk distribution. So um, at first we had one load balancer and then we used like a virtual IP where um, if the first one dies then the virtual IP goes to the second one and so on. Another thing that we thought about is um, we actually use multiple IP addresses so we could have one load balancer per IP address. But then it turns out that um, people who set up their domains usually just pick the first one they see in the docs and then we have some IPs who are, get more traffic than others so this isn't really equally or not, not uniformly distributed. Um, so what we ended up doing is um, we're using something called equal cost multipath routing. And um, what this means is that um, the router sees um, the destination IP address and it knows there's multiple different possible routes to get to the same destination. And the way we do this is we use um, all of our load balancers announce the same IP addresses to the router via BGP. And then um, the router uses ECMP um, um, with uh, something called consistent hashing. Um, on the TCP flow data. So what this means is um, it's, it's a hash function based on the source port, source destination, uh, source port, source IP, destination port, and destination IP. And um, based on those, those four values, it, it determines which load balancer to use. And co it's called consistent hashing because if one of those load balancers dies, um, you don't have to recalculate the entire hash, but only the, only the parts that were mapped to the, um, to the node that died has to be um, have to be uh, remapped. Um, and the, the reason why we use BGP here, um, we, we use a software, usually BGP is for um, router to router communication, I guess, but there's software implementations of BGP that we run on the same server as Nginx. And uh, this allows us to uh, use health checking. So each Nginx, um, each Nginx server health checks its own process. And if Nginx should crash for some reason, it's just going to withdraw the BGP route. And similarly, if the entire node would power down for some reason, BGP has a session timeout, so after a couple of seconds, the route would uh, be withdrawn automatically. Okay, so now um, looking back at, uh, back at the multi-data center setup, um, what we want is we want to be able to move those pods around so that we can utilize the other data centers here. And the way we do this is using BGP Anycast. Um, and um, if you're not sure about Anycast, what that means, um, you can, if you think about how most communication on the internet happens, that's, uh, that's called unicast. So you have a one-to-one -one mapping between sender and receiver. Then there's something like broadcast where you're sending something from one to everyone or multicast where you send something from one to many, and any cast you can think of, you're sending something from one to one of many. Um, historically, this has only been used for UDP or for, for, for protocols that are stateless. 
Um, so DNS is a very good example. Uh, lots of DNS servers use this, but historically it wasn't really used for TCP because um, uh, for the longest time this was not very stable, so it would be possible that some packets get routed here and some packets get routed over there and so on. But um, in the last couple of years this changed a little bit and we, we um, had some monitoring to, if this were to happen, we would see TCP resets on, on one of the servers because it gets packets for a TCP connection that it doesn't know. And we were monitoring this and um, it, it turns out it doesn't really happen, so we can just as well use it. Um, so now if uh, the question, to come back to the question from earlier, what happens if there's a request for a shop that um, ends up in the wrong data center? So if you have a request, an HTTP request for part two that ends up in data center one, it will go down to, the, to one of the load balancers of that data center, um, which runs the sorting hat software that I was talking about. And um, sorting hat now knows, oh, this is supposed to go to the other data center, and it goes over the, over the internal link over to the other one. Um, now, if you look at this, uh, the, next, the next step that you can think of is um, what happens if all of the pods are somewhere else? And this is basically then a point of presence. So um, what this allows us is that we can um, deploy those like mini data centers all around the world. Um, and the goal here is to um, get, the, get the request as early as possible into your own network so it doesn't have to take multiple hops over the internet. Um, so as soon as we get, uh, for example, we could, we could deploy a point of presence in Europe or in Asia or somewhere, and as soon as your, your request gets routed into our data center, you're only one hop away from the real um, data center, which might be way less than um, going over the public internet. And um, this whole setup also uh, is super powerful because it, allow, it allows us to do a lot of experimentation. So um, what, we, what we do is we have one, one of those parts is actually a test part where only um, no real customers are in and we can use this to move it around, like evaluate new hardware or um, evaluate like cloud solutions for example or like all, all those kinds of things. Um, whereas before we, we would only be able to move the entire Shopify uh, platform and now we can move individual um, groups of shops without, yeah, without having to do a full data center failover. Uh, okay, so to summarize and um, to uh, re, um, give you some key takeaways here, um, isolation versus capacity is um, is a trade-off. You can't really have the best of both, but you can you can find something in the middle. Oops. Um, so to come back to this, think of um, multi-tenant architecture as a spectrum. So on the very left you have share nothing, and then on the very right you have share everything. And then what we did is we we started with the databases because that was the most um, the most important part for us at the beginning. Then we went here. This is the potting where we are much closer to, we are sharing many, uh, much less resources. We're still sharing a lot, but it's way less, um, way less than the share everything. And this was, we, we noticed, okay, this was maybe a little bit too far. So going a little bit back to the right where we have the advantages of the potting architecture, but we have this floating capacity to do a little bit more sharing and go more into the cheaper side and more, um, get more capacity. And this is what we, what we are working towards right now and what seems to be, what seems to make the most sense for us and this is kind of our sweet spot. Nginx is one of the best pieces of software that I know and um, a lot of this would not have been possible without Nginx so if you're not using it or if you haven't tried it before, um, it's really cool, try it. Especially with um, OpenRST and um, the possibility to implement your own custom logic in Lua. Nginx itself is, uh, Nginx itself is not super flexible, um, but having this power of the scripting language in Nginx is really cool. Um, BGP, as I said, is um, um, what's, being called, what's, what's called an exterior gateway protocol, so the intention was to communicate uh, at, or to exchange routing information between different autonomous systems, but there's really no reason why you can't use it within your network. So it's, I, I don't know, for me it was a little bit of a, uh, revelation, I guess, to like see, oh, th this is a tool that you can also use at home in your own network and not just between ISPs. And um, yeah, ECMP is a cool tool to, um, a cool protocol to, um, to do routing and to do like uh, high availability um, and stuff like that. And then I think the most important um, lesson that we learned over the last couple of years is that if you run a multi-tenant architecture and you have you have this one, this one company, this one tenant that's causing you lots of pain and like um, it's not really worth it, it's not economical, they're making nowhere near, uh, they're, they're giving you, 
no, nowhere near as much money as they're costing you, um, then don't kick them off your platform, but embrace it and like encourage them and like work towards this because um, all of the preparations that we did for those one or two outlier shops um, helped us to make huge leaps forward in terms of scalability. And it's better to f fix those problems early because then you're really investing into the future and you're, um, you know, you know, it's, it, yeah, it's, way, it's way easier to do it early than, um, than later. So if, it's a very specific problem for us, the specific, specific flash sale problem, but um, try to find your own. If, if, you, if there's any pain points in your platform um, like this, try, try to find them, try to embrace them, and don't try to avoid them, I guess. Uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Uh, I think we have a couple of minutes for questions. Yeah. Uh, hello, it was a very interesting. Uh, just curious, you mentioned using Nginx uh, with Lua uh, for the sort of the software layer load balancing. What, what are you using for uh, implementing BGP and so drone network on those machines? Is it Quagger or something else? Or? Um, the, the, the link here on the last slide, the one in the middle, uh, it's software called XRBGP that we, we have been using for the longest time. Um, and that's, as far as I know, it's a Python implementation of the BGP protocol. Um, and it, yeah, it's pretty cool. You can, um, you basically have to, uh, we, we implemented the, the health checking logic on top of that, and then um, it's pretty simple to set up. All right, cool. Thank you. Cool. I was sitting here spe 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 specifically for the interruption microphone. So, the, uh, so a question, Lua in NGINX, isn't that slow as molasses? Um, actually, no, it's uh, surprisingly fast. Um, I'm not super sure about the details, but the, the way it's implemented is that um, we're using uh, something called Lua JIT, which is a just-in-time compiler for the, for the Nginx, uh, for, the, for the Lua code. Um, so when we deployed this, we actually thought that our monitoring must be broken because we didn't see any increase in latency or anything. Uh, so it, it's surprisingly fast. Okay, cool. Thank you. So for this internal re link between your load balancers, is this more like a logical link or it's a physical dedicated? No, it's, a, it's a basically a fiber optics cable that you can rent from the data center. So we have one data center in Virginia, for example, and one in Ashburn, and we, you basically go to the data center. Um, so we don't actually own those data centers, we're just renting space, and you can also rent those connections, basically. So it's, it, it, is, it is not like a VPN or anything. It's, it's really one hop uh, away from the other data center. But for, you, you mentioned you can build uh, those remote data centers, say, in Asia. Will it work the same way? Um, I would right now, we're at the point where we have only two of those data centers. So um, I would imagine if you, if you have many more, then you, this doesn't, maybe doesn't really work the same way anymore because the, the number of links that you need is growing uh, with the order of two, right? So um, maybe it's not one or two hops away, but we, yeah, we haven't really um, run into that problem yet. Okay, thank you. Cool, if there's no more questions, then thanks.